Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Mountain Monday Zoom session. Tonight we have with us Mr. Brett Wolf. He's an extension specialist in agriculture economics. He aggregates farmers market price reports for Kentucky, manages the new website, as well as the Center for Crop Diversification Facebook page. He is focused on facilitation and communication, and he hopes to grow and strengthen regional and to continue building timely and useful resources for growers and extension professionals in the region. He holds degrees in sociology of agriculture and food from the University of Kentucky. He also has recent specialty crop production experience after working the last three years growing vegetables for field and high tunnel research at the University of Kentucky Horticulture Research Farm. So thank you, Brett, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Heather. Um, so my name is Brett. Uh, I've talked to probably some of you before, uh, one place or another. Uh, but before I jump into the actual presentation materials, I just wanted to make sure that you are familiar with the, the CCD website. This is something that I'm going to refer to several times throughout the talk tonight. Um, and so this is just, it's just uky.edu slash CCD. Uh, and there's a couple of the price reports or one thing I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, there's also some marketing materials for evaluating different market channels. Uh, this is where uh, we hosted a bunch of webinars this past year, including this past fall and winter, and the recordings of those, some of which are a little bit related to what we're talking about now. Um, uh, tonight, uh, are, are, the recordings are available here. Uh, the other thing I'll point out, as far as thinking about marketing, thinking about building a production plan with re in, in relation to marketing, and how you want to market. I would encourage you to take a look and I'll drop this link in the chat. Um, I would take uh, encourage you to take a look uh, at this. There's further down the page, there's uh, actually this publication here. And what it will do is it'll help you to think through having a plan to ha try to have some of, at least some of your products sold before you put it in the ground, or at least have a clearer idea of what market channels might work best for you. There's a couple of presentations, a couple of videos, uh, recorded previous webinars that we have done in the past um, that, that may be useful to you. But I just wanted to acquaint you and make sure you were familiar with the CCD website before I jumped into uh, the presentation. So let me pop in here. And uh, Heather, you're seeing the, the actual full slide, right? Oh, you all see it. If, you, if you're seeing the full slide, somebody drop in the chat and just let me know. I'll just assume that we are. Is something not working, Brett? Are, are you seeing the full slide? Yes, that? yes. Sorry. Okay, okay. That's all right. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to jump on in here. Uh, we got our tech tech issue out of the way early. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about marketing and it's a broad topic. It would be like trying to ask talk somebody to talk about production, um, but I'm going to try to cover it in ways that give you some maybe some food for thought as you think about your marketing plan for this year or for future years. Um, this is part of a curriculum that we've developed called Marketing for All. Uh, which was developed in order to offer something at the 101 entry uh, on ramp onto marketing level. Um, and we got support from the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program through the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So I just want to quickly say thank you to them. And so the way we're going to cover this tonight, uh, I'm going to cover marketing basics first and then apply some of those thoughts in the areas of visual merchandising, you know, how to set up your booth or your stand, or if you have on-farm retail. And then also talk briefly about maybe some options for accepting more than just cash. But starting with just the marketing basics, this is a fairly old school uh, approach to this concept, these four Ps of marketing. And while it is a pretty well established uh, approach, it really fits pretty well for, I think, smaller businesses and for how, getting a grip on what how to approach marketing in the first place. And so what I'll do is I'll work through each of these variables in the four P's of marketing, 
And then I will make sure that we connect these because they, they don't exist on their own. They connect back to each other. They offer opportunities, they offer limitations, et cetera. So I'll connect back to those uh, as we go through. So, but we'll start with product. And so if we're in, when we were in person, I would ask people a trick question and ask them, you know, what kind of product is it that you sell? And they would say, I sell strawberries or I sell leaky greens or I sell beef. And I would push people to think beyond that, because if we're in an environment where we're able to directly sell our product to consumers, in some cases ask for a premium, or in some cases ask them to maybe go out of their way a little bit of the, give up a little bit of the convenience to the modern grocery store or whatever it may be. Uh, part of the enticement to do that can be to help them understand how the product that we grow is actually really special. So you don't just grow a strawberry, you grow a local, pick yesterday, juicy, delicious, premium strawberry. You grow lettuce that hasn't been sitting in a cooler, uh, a refrigerated truck for the last three weeks traveling across the United States. You're selling lettuce that you grew on your farm locally and harvested last night or you know this early this morning before market or you have particular genetics, or you have a particular feeding regimen, or you have whatever it might be for the, the meat that you might produce. So when you're explaining your product, and when you're thinking through what your product is, it's not quite as simple on the surface as it, as it might seem. And the second, the second step of that thinking too is that what might be obvious to you about the inherent quality or the inherent superiority of your product may not be clear to your customer. So making sure we start with a clear picture of what the product is that we're selling and some of the variables, some of the attributes or the qualities that we might look for in a product that we might offer in a product, first one being locality. There's a reason we have a Kentucky Proud. There's a reason we have an Appalachian Proud. There's a reason that we have these branded local focused uh, labels. And that's because there has been some value placed on the localness of the product. And so defining that as part of the product that you sell is important. It may seem, seem simple and straightforward, but it's important. Another variable that might be important is the relationship, being able to establish a relationship with the person who is selling me this product. Uh, this is something that I think gets a lot of publicity and people talk about it a lot. And it is important to some, some customers. Another one here is transparency. Uh, things like the certified organic label or the certified naturally grown or even things like fair trade are symbols that are designed to add transparency to a product to, and to the production system or the labor system in which it was produced. But what we can do as direct marketers is we can actually establish that transparency directly. The reason I want a label telling me what happened to this product long before I saw it is because I never get to meet the person who create, who grew it or who made you know, the soap or what, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to sell. And so transparency is another aspect of the product itself that we have to understand that this is different from the things that you can maybe get at the grocery store. This is different. And that's, this is going to factor in later when we start to talk about the messages that we share out to our customers. So we got to have an idea of what, how good our product is and in what ways it's good in order to share it with them. Which brings me to the last aspect that I'm pointing out here, there's a hundred more different uh, attributes that may be important to you and to your customers. But the last one I'm going to talk about here is quality. And depending on the market, depending on uh, the, the vendor even, sometimes people tend to overlook this in the local food system. There's this sense of like, if it's local, they will come. And I can tell you that based on, this is research coming out of the USDA a little while back, uh, look, talking to people who purchase local food and asking them the simple question of why is it that you purchased that local food? Most of them cited, two of the top three reasons cited was freshness and taste. So this idea that this product is a higher level of freshness, it maybe tastes better and is a higher quality ingredient. And they also listed things like health, safety and the freshness of the product. They, these things just keep coming up. The reason this is important is because especially if we're trying to reach consumers who are maybe outside of the uh, true believers of the local food system, we're trying to reach those people who maybe shop at the grocery store more often 
or people who for whom this is their first time buying fresh uh farm fresh lettuce they usually get lettuce that's chopped out of a bag or in a one of those heads uh, heads wrapped in plastic uh being able to understand the priorities that they have which is freshness and taste much more so than oh this is a magical local lettuce that you know solves all the issues or whatever it may be that might be important to, to, to other consumers. Now, people do mention supporting farmers, supporting their local economy in these conversations, but I just point this out mainly to emphasize, don't leave out that quality thing. And in reality, we have as local food producers or, or local product producers, we really have an, a nice opportunity to tell that story about how good our product is and during normal times offer samples and things like that. So that's our product section. So the next one here is place, because we are selling the products that we're growing in different places. Uh, this picture here on the left is uh, from one of the farmers markets in Lexington a couple years ago. And on the right here, uh, if you recognize the, the pricing labels there, that's at a Walmart. Yet if you check out the little blue sticker there, it tells us Bourbon County. So these are local and it's even branded at Walmart as a local product. And so as I'm thinking about, okay, my local tomato, and there's tomatoes on that table there uh, at that farmer's market stand as well, my local tomato, the place where I'm selling it is going to influence the price that I get as a producer, but it's also going to influence my ability to tell the story of what this product is or how it is. Uh, I don't, most farmers who are selling at Walmart don't stand next to the bin in every store where their product is being sold. Now they're able to sell more volume, but at the same time, they don't have that same opportunity for the transparency and the relationship development offered through the, the place there. Even within typical, uh, what we typically think of as farmer's markets or, or even just general local food markets, location changes things. Um, so the, you hear location, location, location in the, uh, the world of real estate, but it also has to do with it also determines the types of products that we sell, the prices we can get, the types of customers that we might attract, uh, all of these different variables, which are going to be broken down in the next couple of slides, uh, are going to stick, figure in, factor into uh, how we approach marketing our products. But the one thing I would say as a caveat or as a best practice overarching thing is that adapting your market strategy to fit the needs of your target market is going to save you a ton of heartache. Another way to say this is try to grow and market the products that people in the area in your area already want. That doesn't mean that we can't establish new markets for new products or show people things, give them samples, let them try it out. But the world of making in, in the food industry. The world of making people want things that they don't, didn't want already is a multi, multi billion dollar industry. Giving people things that they already want, it can be a less of an uphill battle. Um, and I'll come back to what I mean specifically by this from examples that I've seen uh, in, in Kentucky and in this region. Uh, but this first thing here, this is on this previous slide, but we tend to see that markets, and this is not just in Kentucky, but in Kentucky, uh, farmers markets, on on farm markets, and just generally populations of local food shoppers tend to fall somewhere on this spectrum. Very few are all the way to the left or all the way to the right on this uh, on this spectrum, but they tend to fall into one of these two categories with different different uh, characteristics from the other. So on the on the left hand side of our screen here, credence markets are what my mom might call like yuppie markets or maybe more modern bougie markets. Uh, places, and you'll see that tend to be in, in urban areas, though not always. Um, the customers tend to be less price sensitive, i.e. just one more time to borrow from my mom, they have maybe have more money than cents sometimes. Um, they are people who are interested in this, this low house thing is lifestyle of health and sustainability. Uh, what that means is the next bullet point, they tend to gravitate towards some of these credence attributes. They might be interested in organic or grass-fed or heirloom or maybe the story of the farm or some sort of artisanal property. Um, 
they tend to show a little bit more loyalty to specific vendors, you know, as opposed to going to the market to get stuff at the lowest possible price. And the last one here, again, we're describing the consumers, uh, tend, they tend to purchase their value added products. Now, if we contrast that with the right hand side of the screen and we talk about price markets here, uh, these are ones where people tend to be more price sensitive. They tend to be looking for better deals. They start, they're shopping for value. Part of that may include looking for uh, discounts for buying in bulk. Um, in contrast with that idea of the patron or the loyalty to a particular vendor, they're looking for the best price on the product that they're looking for. And as such, those products are kind of interchangeable. So things like heirloom or things like uh, credence attributes, like organic or something like that, have a little bit less uh, cachet has a little bit less value to some of the customers in the price markets. Uh, and the last one here, again, contrasting with in the credence, on the left hand side, on the credence market, people may purchase a pint of blueberry jam. In the price markets, shoppers are doing their own value added, so they're looking to buy a couple of gallons of blueberries at a discount to do their own value adding, or they're looking to buy a bushels of corn or bushels of bean and put beans and put those things up for themselves. Um, and so again, not all markets fall one or the other. Sometimes there's a blending of the two, but we do tend to see uh, this discrepancy play out in some places. And I, I'm not sure if, if you all recognize these shoppers or these particular people in your area, uh, one, one way or the other. Um, and, and the thing I mentioned earlier that I said I'd come back to about if you can give people what they want, you're not fighting as uphill of a battle as trying to make them want what you have. Um, the, I, some of the more frustrating or heartbreaking stories around trying to market products directly through uh, these types of markets tend to be when someone is living and operating in an area that has a lot of price markets and price shoppers, and they really wish that they operated in a world that had credence markets. Uh, what I mean by that, they, they wish that the people didn't want the, the lowest price. They want people to pay higher prices because higher prices mean more means more revenue per unit. They want people to uh, value the maybe the certified organic label or whatever it might be. And, and it's one of those situations where if you just take a look at the market that you're in and you assess what people might want that you can deliver and build your marketing and production plan around that, you're going to have a little bit less of an uphill battle. Um, the one thing I don't want to forget to mention here down at the bottom, this comparison of vendor access and particularly these dollar signs, getting access to these credence markets tends to be a little bit more challenging because everybody wants to sell to the people who don't care how much stuff costs. Everybody wants to sell. Well, when you take a look at the vendor fees in a city like Lexington or Louisville can be thousands of dollars in the course of the season. Compare that to, it might be 25 bucks in some of our price markets in, in rural areas or in uh, not, not in that peak uh, credence market territory. Um, so these tend to overlap somewhat with the urban markets and the rural markets. Um, again, urban markets, a little bit harder to get into, maybe more expensive. Uh, there's more differentiation there. Um, there may be multiple markets within an urban area, which maybe allows for more people to get in. But I'll also say, like in the city of Lexington, I think that we sometimes, our, our markets have represented uh, the range from these credence markets with high dollar, lots of value added, all the way to something that resembles more of a rural market. Um, the rural areas, obviously, you're closer to the vendors, you have less travel, less traffic, uh, but less consumers as well. Um, and the thing about folks in the country is they know how to garden, and so there's a little more competition there once stuff comes in, um, which is something that a lot of people who are from, the, from those areas know that. Um, so the, four, the third of the sort of four P's here is price. So we've talked about understanding what our product is and how it's fundamentally different from some other products that maybe people are familiar with. We've talked about the place that we're going to sell it and making sure we understand what the values of that market channel or that particular market are. Now we're going to talk about the prices that we might expect. 
uh, and how do we even begin to think about that? So this is one I pointed out on the CCD website earlier. Uh, we do have price reports available. This is the three-year average price report. Um, I actually need to update because we have a new one out uh, that's on the website now. You can just go to the price report section and you'll see it. Um, but we also have, um, so we have uh, on the left-hand side here, these are farmer's market price reports, which we do every week throughout the season. We post these, um, usually we have between seven and 15 markets reporting, just depending on how busy people get or, uh, but these are weekly reports from all across the state with real prices for real products at farmer's markets. Uh, and then we take those and we combine them into these three year average reports, which will give us some of the, the slides that I'll show you later with uh, the graphs on them. But those variables we talked about, the product and understanding what it is and the place, combining those, they can either give us opportunities for pricing or they can really put a lot of constraints on the prices that we can get. And what I mean by that is if we pick the right product for the right place, for the right customer base, we might be able to get a pretty good product because we're going to have a ton of demand. And especially if our product is really, really good and we can differentiate and help people to understand how good our product is, um, we might be able to get a little bit better price. At the same time, certain markets are always going to be oriented toward price and they're looking for the lowest price possible. Uh, and so the, the product, you may be something where you need to look at a high tunnel, maybe an early tomato is the way that you can break through on some of those constraints on pricing. Um, but understanding those two things, you have to keep those both in mind as you go to set your product. You don't want to set your price too low because your product is incredible and it's not something everybody can, somebody can get everywhere. Uh, at the same time, if you go and ask people anywhere in the state of Kentucky for Eight dollars for uh, for a pound of tomatoes, they'll look at you crazy. But if you do that in New York City, maybe a different story. So, um, this is some of the graphs from the, the pricing thing. Unfortunately, is something you're just going to have to spend some time thinking through, taking a look at your costs. I actually do a whole talk on pricing and looking at some of these graphs and going through that. Um, but this is so the the blue line here are urban prices and the orange line are rural prices per pound for beans. So this is $3.50, $3.50. Um, again, I need to get the updated. The, the new data, it's funny, farmers markets don't really change that drastically across time. Our new 2020 data will be different, but those, that, that data is not ready. Uh, those data aren't ready yet. Um, this is just kind of like the price is more or less flat, a little bit of an uptick in the tails. Um, just information to try to determine what your prices might look like. Uh, carrots, again, I think this orange line here, I think maybe represents some of the rural gardening comes in. Maybe these people have a system that they know they can sell carrots all through the whole season. I don't know. Um, but again, this is just giving you an, an idea of what's in these reports. These are tomato prices. Uh, and these are all available for download in uh, PDF form. So again, the, the bottom line or the take home point here is that pricing is gonna be determined by the product that you have and being able to figure out what the going rate is for that product in the area that you are, what people will accept based on how good your product is. People will generally pay for quality regardless of where you are. Um, so just something uh, something to keep in mind but the last one i'll talk about here is promotion so we now have a clear idea in our head of what our product is why it's valuable why it's good we have an understanding of the audience that we're shooting for and we feel confident about the prices that we're asking or we feel like we'll be able to make those adjustments if we need to so while all having all of that information inside of your brain is wonderful the actual part that we think of as marketing has yet to happen because now you have a clear picture. You need to help other people understand that they have a clear picture. And frankly, marketing is not that much more complicated than that. The methods we may use may become more complicated, but fundamentally it is this can on a line. We're trying to tell somebody else about this product that we're putting out there and, and how and why, that, how they can get it, why they should get it. 
and and hopefully uh, letting that happen. And sometimes doing that over and over and over again until you build enough of a of a following. And we there's all kinds of high tech solutions now available, but sometimes the oldies are are, are still the goodies. Uh, these are some signs just from some different uh, markets across the, the state. I can tell you the sign on the right with the little tile saying sweet corn is in now, much more effective than having somebody come into your store and stalk you and ask you when the sweet corn's in. Well, just wait till the sign's out there. We're going to communicate this information to you and tell you that it's here, and then people can come in and get it. Um, that don't you don't have to necessarily overthink the messaging that we're doing um it could be that this is the most appropriate way to go about promoting your product and telling people that it's in if you already have that built now we do live in the high uh, higher tech age than just that and in the age in the era this particular last year craziness communicating information via digital means has been something that's gained in importance though it was very very important for a long time i've been doing social media talks for for a while now um so the first one i have so i'll go ahead and put them all out so the the first one i have here is facebook i've listed these three so facebook instagram and then that last one's just a generic thing for a website i've listed them in the order that i would consider adding them to my marketing operation this is not a hard and fast rule it's just a general idea Facebook, I would always add Facebook first because it's generally free except for your time. Excuse me. It is, there are a ton of people on it, especially people in the demographic range who have money right now. Um, younger people may be going away from Facebook, but people in the millennial, late, like older millennial through to the boomers and beyond, a lot of them are on Facebook. Facebook is really good at showing up on um, uh, like Google searches for search, in, search engine optimization, SEO. And it has a lot of built-in analytics that can kind of help you see how things are going. And it gives you a chance to get started with some of this digital marketing without too much investment of time or energy. It's pretty relatively simple as things go. The next one I would maybe think about is Instagram, which is now owned by Facebook. Not now, it's been for a while, but it's owned by Facebook. So Instagram is a picture and video driven content suite. Um, if you have a lot of visual items related to your operation and you want to share those with people, Instagram is a really good way to do that. If you don't, you know, no sweat. Um, the other one I would say is the website as a, as a means of promotion. Sometimes I think people feel like they should have a website and they can't really articulate any other reason why they want to have one. If that's the only reason is because you feel like you should, I, it may not be a very compelling reason. If you have for certain aspects of your story, if you want to enhance your brand, if you want to sell online through your website, all those are great reasons to do that. But if you're just kind of thinking, maybe I should have a website, I would consider starting with a Facebook page if you're amenable to that. And that's a Facebook business page, um, which is something I covered in some of our webinars in the past. Um, along with the, the internet, uh, I mean, sorry, the website, thinking about starting an email list is another thing that we have talked about in previous webinars and other places, and that would be another really great place to start. Issue with that is, you know, you have to get people to give you their email address in the first place, uh, and that might not be the first lines of promotion if you're just looking to get started. The other thing I'll mention, I'm, you know, I'm a broken record on this, uh, but not all of our approaches need to be the brand new technological approaches. Radio and newspapers still do have effects in our communities in this state. And in some cases, the, these places will do free promotion for a farmer's market or like a really cool local food business. They'll do like a featured story piece on you. Um, you can also just do old school kind of like do an ad, run it, running advertisements and paying for it. Um, so those are just some angles that you might consider with promotion. A couple others, just to think about Kentucky Proud, the branding campaign, uh, it is free to join for producers. It is a very recognizable label. Um, I would say of all the state branding campaigns, this really is one of the better ones as far as I've seen traveling around. 
they do also have some cost share programs available to help you if you want to have a banner printed or if you wanted to do some advertisement, they'll kind of share the cost of that. Uh, they also offer some at what they call at cost promotional products, which is hats with Kentucky Proud and bags and price card pricing cards for your table, um, et cetera. And there's also kind of an online support community on Facebook, uh, and I think maybe on their on their website as well. A uh, couple of other ideas people tend to like when I just throw out brainstorming kind of ideas. So on the left here, this uh, Apple. I don't know if that's the, the good apple or the bad apple that spoiled the batch. So he, this is a intern we had, he's a French guy named Martin. And he was uh, wanted to, when he was visiting with us, or when he was working with me a couple of years ago, he wanted to go and see uh, some of the agritourism venues around. And so I agreed as long as I could take embarrassing pictures of him. But um, I took this picture and I thought, you know, it was kind of a cute thing to give him to send back to France. But at the same time, this, this is part of a marketing outreach campaign because they didn't just put this up. They put this up and they put their name on it. Now, imagine just for a second that it's not Martin, a 19-year-old French guy. And instead, it's this cute little girl up here with the bunny. And she's in it. And it's not me taking a picture. It's her mom or her dad. And that person then posts it to Instagram and says, oh, we had a wonderful day with you know, the kids out picking apples. I just really love my kids being able to see what it's like to, you know, do it to uh, how food is grown or whatever it may be. And they share that with the other parents. And suddenly the other parents are now interested in going to this place. So as you think about social media, social media advertisement is different from the old school traditional advertisement in that the old school approach was to take a message and broadcast it out to people. Social media marketing is about getting people to market your product to their friends. And not in like, a, I'm paying you to do it, but like, I'm giving you the opportunity to share that this product or this experience or this, my brand or my business was good for you or you enjoyed it. That is a lot of what social media advertisement is. Um, there's parts of that that's really cool. There's parts of that that are kind of bleak, but... <laughs> It's the world, the world that we're living in. If you want to do that, providing these opportunities like this one. Um, I have this, that, that little girl up there to, for that story, but also because it, to remind me that there are uh, sometimes markets or, or different uh, downtown organizations or whatever, they'll do like some sort of kids day. Um, in the case of a farmer's market, it'll be, you know, you go around to each booth and you get a stamp and at the end you get a t-shirt or you get a free, whatever, uh, apple. Now, part of it is cool because it's like supporting kids and getting them involved in the market and that's all wonderful. The other reason I suspect is that in the state of Kentucky, at least three and four year olds still cannot drive themselves. And so most of them will have a parent or a grandparent or a guardian or whatever attached with them who might come to the market and might just have some money and might just spend that money uh, as part of that experience. So that is another kind of promotional angle approach that some, some groups and markets have taken. Um, the last thing I have on this slide here is this ad down in the corner, uh, which, you know, we have Kro Kroger's in, uh, in most of Kentucky, uh, but the, the, message is the same. If you are attracting customers who are used to shopping in a supermarket scenario, I mean, we, I grew up shopping in supermarkets, I still do a lot. The messaging that they will see and that they will be familiar with is going to be a little bit different. And this is the type of messaging and advertising they're used to seeing. And so if you have a bumper crop of something, or if you have, you know, you're trying to get more people in or whatever, you might consider promotions that look a little more like this. That there is a sale, and it's not really a sale. It's you trying to get rid of the 200,000 cucumbers that you have that are just backing up, or that you know, you're know you sick of picking tomatoes. Okay, we're going to do a blowout on tomatoes, or whatever it may be. Um, so that's just another thing to think about is that not it, it doesn't always have to be the like local food forward audience. It could be people who are a little more, I don't know, normal, typical. Um, Couple other just brainstorming ideas. Some of these overlap and some of them aren't as appropriate now as they maybe have been at other times, but you could think about having customers or buyers come out to the farm. There may be some insurance considerations there. Um, 
So don't don't leap without don't leap without looking there. Um, if you're going to a restaurant or if you're going to any sort of environment where you're trying to get somebody to to think about buying your product who wasn't thinking about it before, samples, examples, et cetera, giving somebody a, oh, you know, you're not sure about this uh, Asian eggplant here, just take one, cook it this way and see if you like it. Um, giving out those samples and examples can, can be something to help share the, build some loyalty and share the messaging uh, of how great your product is. Uh, I would say the next two are both kind of like having either getting things printed, could be business cards, could be brochures, um, having some information to take that goes with the product that either helps the a chef or a restaurateur or whatever share the message about what the pro what your product is that they're featuring, or in the case of the take home items, which is maybe more appropriate for this audience, um, when I bite into that delicious, tasty, seasonal strawberry in, you know, mid-May, and I think, oh man, the strawberry season isn't over yet. I want to go get some more. If I have some sort of a take-home item, some sort of card or whatever, I'm able to trace that back and remember I got it from that person. I'm going to go back and find them or check their own website, find their Facebook page and see if they still have stuff in, whatever, message you. Um, and the other part of that too is the, the packaging as a promo item. And so I, so I talk about like, so for instance, with, let's go with that example of the strawberry, if you have a little container and you just take and put a little sticker, your little business's sticker on there, you have now for the cost of one little sticker bought a little billboard in the refrigerator of the customer that you sold that product to. Now, this all hinges on whether or not your product is actually good. If your product is bad, you, that billboard is a, a reminder, but we're all just going to assume that everybody on here's product is really, really good and you're proud of it. Using that package as a promotional item uh, can be a helpful way to, to hammer that message home. Um, and, and packaging, you can kind of hack that a little bit. Uh, you can get stickers printed separately and buy generic bags, put them together, and now you have a branded bag that you don't have to get printed. I've also seen people do like um, get a stamp made for like I don't know 10 or 15 bucks you said you send them an image they make you a little stamp and a stamp pad and now you can stamp and make as many bags as you want with it like an ink stamp like uh you used to put on you know, put on your hand or whatever um just another another option for getting some sort of branding visibility onto the bag and so um just to re recap what we've covered here before we move on to the next section uh we talked about the product that you're selling and, and understanding what your product is and a little bit even more fundamentally what your business and brand are, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, then making sure that it's a good fit for the places that you're trying to sell it. Then making sure that the pricing that you can expect from those places is appropriate, comparing it how much it's gonna cost you to assess profitability. This is stuff where some of those tools and publications I mentioned can be helpful. And then last, making sure that you tell people at every opportunity that you have and using as many tools as you can keep up with, telling them about the message. So it's, it's really, you know, marketing gets cloaked in this real mysterious language. And I mean, a lot of it's just kind of sticking with it, doing sometimes very repetitive things uh, in order to try to make sure that some, uh, some of your messaging gets out. Okay. So the next section I'm going to talk about vis this visual merchandising component and, um, we're going to touch on some of those things we just talked about in this, uh, but I'm going to really quickly just go and take a look at the chat and just see if there were any questions or anything that came up. I've got one for you, but you might be getting ready to address it. Okay, you can go ahead and ask me and I'll see if it. Okay. Are there resources available that can help small scale farmers with their logo and with their branding? Like maybe coming up with a, a farm name or a catchy slogan or even an actual logo. Yes. So, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about that specifically in the next bit. So I'll go ahead and, and, and try to just, and, and Heather, if you have things that come to mind for you, you should share them too. Um, a couple of groups that may be able to be of direct help. Um, I would recommend anybody who's thinking about getting serious about their business, get in touch with KCARD. People get tired of hearing me say it, but we it is another one of those like 
we have this rare gym in Kentucky that does really great direct support, most of it free uh, for small producers and ag businesses. And so it's, it's K-C-A-R-D, K-Card. And if you just Google that, it's kcard.info is their website, but um, they would be a great place to start. I don't know that they're going to be the ones who do your logo design, or but they, they should be able to help you connect. Uh, I know we have some other, other, other agents on too, so if these things come up with that. Um, another resource, I'm not, so I know uh, the Small Business Development Center, SBDC, um, they're another great resource, a, lot, a similar line, uh, kind of helping with business development. There might be, do you all know any of the, the agents or, or folks from the, the region? Do you know, I feel like I'm missing, missing maybe a, like a region specific group that might be able to provide some support on that. Would that be something SOAR might be able to help with? I'm not real familiar with that organization. I, I'm, th I'm thinking so. I, I might actually just follow up. I could follow up with you, Heather, and, and we can and double check. But um, I, I will say any of those, like KCARD and SBDC, they, they'd be able to point you to those places too. And it'd be a good way to just check in with them about what they're, um, what they can what they can offer you and what they what they can't but uh, there are some at least people to help uh and in some cases there might even be some funding uh, available to to be able to help with some of that i know that yeah depending on how it plays out and what you get printed and, and where the the kda money can sometimes be used with promotional stuff and so i don't know how that shakes out with the the with the logo development itself but um Okay, so I'm gonna jump in here on the, the visual merchandising. And again, so I, I mentioned before um, that understanding what your product is, is a really important uh, first step to all the messaging and, and thoughts that come afterwards. I would go ahead and just say, the bigger question is thinking about what your brand is. What is it that you're offering to consumers? Uh, and all the variables I'm going to go through in the next little bit uh, are about, they can help you tell the story or they can distract from it or, or lose that story. And so if what you're about is providing fresh, local, farm-grown products to your community, a really high-tech, fancy light show associated with your display or something like that is just completely inappropriate. At the same time, if you're trying to market to a little bit more of a highbrow crowd, a little more modern, you know, somebody that people that buy more like uh, like sleek products, people in that credence market, for instance, who maybe want to buy their uh, the the value added products and stuff like that, a bunch of hay bales and a very rustic presentation may not be the right presentation there. Uh, in any in any case thinking about what your brand, re reconnecting with who your customers are, what might make them feel comfortable in your, in your decisions about this stuff um, is going to be important. It, it'll also help you decide what products you offer, what products you stop offering. You got to constantly be kind of thinking about what your, what your customer might need. Um, so first and foremost, if you're selling food, I mean, really any other product, but food in particular, uh, one of the biggest concerns consumers mention is going to be food safety. And so a dirty or untidy retail location, display, booth, whatever, it can convey either like a lack of professionalism at the best or even like a risk of to human health at the worst. So um, also going back to what's the message that you're trying to send, which fundamentally is kind of like, please buy this product. It really looks really good. See, you can't even take your eyes off of it. Clutter can be a distraction from that central message. And it can also kind of stress people out. Um, you ever get that feeling of like calm after you declutter your house? You know, if, it, if it's me or my office once a year, uh, I feel really great for a couple of weeks. That stressful experience, if you can reduce that for your customers, that would be great. So clean and tidy, hopefully that goes without saying. We'll come back to this picture here in a little bit. Uh, another note here is that if if we mentioned quality as one of those variables that we really, really want to have uh, because customers value it very, very highly and it might be the reason we're able to charge a premium. If you don't have 
high quality, attractive products, then the rest of these practices are going to be like a beautiful frame on the on a terrible picture. It does not change the central proposition that you're offering. So uh, everything that you should you're doing should be enhancing and and emphasizing the product the quality of the product that you're offering. Not it's not going to be able to distract from it. The other thing I'll mention is thinking about we think a lot about the product that we're putting out, the business, the branding, the logos. But in direct marketing, when you're selling your product, you're also selling yourself. And uh, I know, you know, none of us would judge anyone for looking a certain way or dressing a certain way. But if someone trying to sell me some leafy green and they're covered in dirt like this guy on the left, who looks very cool in the picture. But if that person's trying to sell me uh, uh, some leafy greens or a... Uh, stack of pancakes, I'm going to be a little bit hesitant. Like, I'm not really sure what's going on here. So I know people are coming from farms in many cases, or they're coming from some other thing. So just keep, I used to work on a farm and then I would teach in the evening and I would just have to keep changes of clothes and have to figure out how I was going to make, make a part of the, the plan to present myself as professional. Um, and I think this is something that, and not not just the appearance, but the the very the role of the person in the direct marketing is something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And I think if you've chosen direct marketing, it's something on some level you kind of got to make some peace with that this is just part of the equation. It's going to require some effort, um, not just changing your clothes, but being able to interact with people. And if you're not super into interacting with people, it may be time to bring somebody else into the business who's, who is more interested in that type of, uh, of activity. So normally I do this whole presentation as this hands-on version where I have, uh, I have a faux dirty shirt and I have lots of examples and like I actually bring a full setup of, fruits and, of fake fruits and vegetables that I use uh, to demonstrate this stuff and it has a little more effect in that way, but the principles here are the, are the same. Um, so another variable to think about with the, the uh, way that you're setting things up in your retail location is thinking about the floor plan and the flow of your booth. Um, a lot of this is just about visibility, vendor convenience, uh, customer experience. And what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna hide our products from view and we don't want to uh, overcrowd things, but at the same time, we wanna take advantage of the space as much as possible. So in this, the, the brown things are tables. They're, you know, these are roughly a 10 by 10, like a farmer's market stand, uh, a lot of farmer's market stands are. The purple thing is you, you and maybe the how you're gonna take money or where you're gonna accept money. Um, I can't tell you exactly which one of these is gonna work perfectly for your product and your audience, but I can tell you that if you take a, take a moment to step back and look and think ahead of time, you might be able to uh, head off some problems of crowding. Because in like, so for instance, I'm not sure if you can see nothing, but in the uh, column three, row two, this is great for getting product out there. And if you have stuff out to the outside and people are able to get to the outside of your booth, it's great. However, if you get two people in here browsing and you don't, and uh, the people in your market are not super into being in close proximity, even in a non COVID year, you've now, the crowds of people are just going to go on by and go on by. So thinking about being able to accommodate a little bit more space maybe would be something that would be good. In the same way, here, hiding behind these two tables. Uh, that may be effective for your social anxiety, but if you wanted to talk to people and get them in and say, hey, how are you? Try, you know, try this. See if they're interested in this. That might not be the, uh, the best option. A couple of the other things to just keep in mind, this is maybe common sense, but um, thinking about sunlight, the way that sun moves, thinking about the potential rain plan, if things start, if there's a downpour that comes down, uh, being able to pull things under a tent or whatever, that's just another aspect. Uh, one thing I would recommend though, as far as this particular aspect of it, along with some of the others that we'll talk about, is take, go ahead and take a picture of your booth or of your setup or whatever um, every time you set it up. Because 
in the moment on the morning of setting everything up and getting everything figured out and the truck won't start and all the other chaos that might happen, you may not be in the right state of mind to think critically about how you would want to change things around. And this is going to be one of the things later is record and reflect, but this is the way of recording and reflecting. And if you're doing the social media thing, snap a picture, post, hey, we're down here till whatever. Now you have a dated uh, social media promoting picture of how things are set up for you and you can then go back and, re and reflect on it later. So again, all of this is just, you're trying to create a nice smooth experience for your customers uh, and also a nice selling environment where you're able to get more product out in front of more people. Okay, so these are like the precursors, I think, to what most people think of as visual, visual merchandising. A lot of what we actually think about uh, are these visual cues. And so um, let me see if I have, yeah, okay. So these different signifiers here, this is what I call the, the knee to eye range. This is, a, this is a reflection of the fact that people don't like to overextend to reach overhead and they don't like bending over to pick stuff up. And if you're expecting them to buy something from you, they definitely don't wanna do those things. This one here is lighting thinking about lighting. Um, I usually have little, if, if you're in a dark environment, you might consider bringing in some supplemental lighting. Uh, but next time you're in the grocery store or a uh, retail store like Kohl's or you know the mall or whatever, um, Walmart, look up at how much lighting is in those places. And it's not just the lighting that makes everything uh, bright and shiny. It's strategically placed in places to make certain things pop. Look inside the coolers where they sell all the produce. Look inside the coolers where they sell all the, uh, the frozen stuff. There is so much lighting in our retail environments, and it's because light, we're, we're drawn to light like moths, you know? And so lighting is just something to think about. Uh, uh, one easy way to think through this is uh, there's generally a recommendation to not use like a red tent cover because it casts this dark red kind of stressful tint on everything. A white one, it, it creates this nice, almost like a, like a soft photo lighting on our product. Middle of summer, it may not give enough solar protection, it may get hot, but it, that's just another thing to think about in the, in the visual presentation of what you're doing. And the last note here is about abundance. This is one that gets a ton of play. You know, the, we always want abundance. We always want abundance. Nobody wants the last bunch of kale from the display. They want to take one off of a, a, a mound as, as tall as they are. We like abundance in our displays. Well, you don't always have to um, have a ton of stuff to give a sense of abundance. But this, this is an example in a grocery store. Um, you can see, so in this case, these things are tilted. Because, so they are literally like almost falling out at you, right? And then if you look at, uh, at these, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but the little bins on the right where it says R2499, the Royal Gala, these are, and this is not even from a US uh, um, uh, grocery store, but if, if you look at this on these little, these bin, vertical bins here, it gives the impression that these things are full of apples, that it's like five solid feet or you know, four solid feet stacked deep of apples. But if you pulled those things up and you look, there's a little shelf just underneath where all those apples are. The whole point here is to give you a sense of abundance. If you look straight up from these apples, the lighting would just, would be unbelievable. There's multiple spotlights that are shining down on this. Just something to think about. You don't necessarily have to integrate that into your uh, farmer's market stand. But the abundance, a couple of things you can do very, very simply. If you have a container that you're putting product in, and let's say you don't have enough to fill it up, you can take and you can get plastic bags, just Ziploc bags, blow some air in them to make these kind of air bags, seal them, stack them up, and put your product on top. And now suddenly, boom, you have a little abundant. Um, abundance implying um, container. You can also use smaller containers. Don't, don't go and buy, if you have 25 apples to sell, don't buy a half bushel, uh, you know, bourbon barrel thing, no matter how cool it looks. Go and get a small plastic, I use plastic flower pots in my demonstration and they look really nice. 
Um, so not putting things out, not putting everything that you have out all at once and being able to replenish throughout the day and also accounting for the size of the container are two key ways to be able to give that sense of abundance. Again, the knee to eye thing, we want to not put things down too low that they're hard to grab, not too high that people have to stretch. However, the other issue with, farmer, with a lot of farmers market booths and a lot of retail environments, uh, like kind of smaller scale retail environments, we do want to take advantage of the full knee to eye spectrum. So not just having things just flat on a tabletop. So in my exam, in when I do my slides, I actually have like a, a Tupperware container, not a Tupperware, like a big like Rubbermaid container. And I flip it over with no lid and I put it under the table and then I pull it out almost like a stair step that comes out. And then there's a little, and I think I have some examples in here of some shelving. Yeah, so like this, uh, this top left picture here, this person now has taken advantage of that upper area with some shelving to be able to, the people can see. What you can do is you can create the illusion that there's way more product here and take more advantage of the full range of what people can see. In this case too, excuse me, from the knee up to the eye of the typical person is all of that space is being taken up, which again, adds to the sense of abundance. If these things were all just in big containers and they were all just one in one plane, which is how you would store them if you were trying to store them efficiently, it wouldn't be nearly as impressive, but these are tipping out the angled, uh, the angled presentation is another. Um, I can tell you all these things and point some of them out, but honestly, next time you go to Walmart, next time you go to the grocery store, next time you go to like a, a clothing store, just pay attention to some of the things that they do and see if you can apply any of those to what to what you're doing. But because it, it's a uh, it's pretty pretty crazy once you see, start to see how much um, our, our retail environments are manipulated to make us uh, make us want things. So um, let's see. The last thing I'll talk about briefly is color, and I think I have another. Yeah, okay. Um, so color is the, the most important colors that are in your display are the product your products colors so if i have this lime green container that i bring this like neon bright green container that i bring as a terrible example of a product for that type of application because it just draws your eye right to it it makes everything else seem dingy in all of these cases here we have a you know simple pulp containers that are not distracting and the color of the tomatoes and the green of the peppers looks great. Here you have this natural wood and a really muted understated um, tablecloth. Again, making these green tomatoes and some of these flowers really stand out. Uh, and then here a little bit bolder, uh, but still simple tablecloth. And then maybe I would think about having a little bit more of a stair step approach to this, but the color of the strawberries is there to just really stand out. Um, and in this case, it's all kind of one solid color. You can also experiment with alternating colors, kind of like this. Um, so, and different people have different uh, preferences, but this kind of checkerboard pattern looks really attractive. It's drawn in. You can notice the stair stepping here to take up more. You could easily, there's no need to have these red, red boxes even here at all. You could easily have all of this just flat on the table, but this makes it seem like, oh my gosh, there's a whole mountain of berries jumping out at me. Uh, again, these containers looking very abundant. Look at this. I mean, why do you need, why on earth do you need this many apples in this small of a container? Well, I can tell you, it makes it look like there's a ton of apples there. And I feel like I'm getting a really good deal because look how jam packed they've made these containers. I'm not even, get, I'm getting a full you know, order of apples here. Um, so th these are just some different ways that you can play around with color and use the, I mean, the sunlight playing off these berries looks lovely. Uh, I'm not sure how intentional that was as much as just that's the way that the, the sun moves. Um, but just a couple of, uh, a couple of things to point out there that I, I think this is a really nice looking one, uh, looking display. So another thing we talk about is, is using signs. Um, signs play very different roles. So they can tell people who you are. They can explain some of those attributes of your product. Uh, they can let people know how much they cost. 
they can also contribute partially to the, the actual brand that you're conveying here. So like in this case, this to me, I mean, it says Spain here. I'm guessing this is Firenze. I'm guessing this is somewhere in Italy, maybe. I don't know why they put Spain there. Um, so maybe, it's, oh, Great British Pound per kilo. So whatever. This has a very, to me, like this fancy Western European small market feel. This type of tag. Whereas, and I use in the when I do the the presentation in front of people, uh, I mean in like in in whatever in real life in in person, um, I I'll have these little white Kentucky Proud cards that are super nice, but they give a very clear indication we're in Kentucky. We're talking about Kentucky here, so those types of price signs can be a part of what your uh, what your brand is sharing. But something that I would recommend about pricing in American markets is to have prices on everything because those prices are like a security blanket for shy people. There are some people who don't want to come up and haggle with you over the tomatoes. They just want to know how much they are and know how many they can buy. And it also, if there's people who are, this is their first time or they're not really that comfortable in farmer's markets, it lets them know, here's the situation. Here's the, and the more that we want to attract those people to these markets, the better. So we do recommend having uh, pricing signs for everything. Now you can do individual price signs on everything, or you can have one central board that kind of explains the prices for everything and that that's easier for you. Um, if your products aren't super obvious what they are, or maybe somebody who isn't that familiar with the different produce or cuts of meat or whatever, uh, you might have to do some explaining and some, some coaching there. Uh, but generally speaking, we do recommend that. Um, other signs you might think about things, uh, somebody mentioned the logo and the farm branding, that would be another component. Uh, that could be a sign, it could be one of those banners, it could be a number of different things. Um, think about using signs if you have a particular special deal or a crop that you're really, or a product that you're really trying to move. Um, we mentioned that we pointed out those things earlier, the, the signs out in front of the agritourism and the, the produce auction they advertised when a new product had come in, you know, the, the sweet corn is in or tomatoes are in, like that type of thing. That could be another sign that you might consider using. Um, this might be chalkboard, but I'll, I like to look at a chalkboard and a little chalkboard pin, um, which I didn't know existed a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, it could, could be a, a, a neat way of doing that. Uh, another thing you might consider if you have particular growing practices that you're proud of or that you want to kind of convey or if you're a family farm or if you uh, grow everything that you sell or whatever, uh, that might be another thing to consider putting on a sign just to let people know. Because I'm telling you, a lot of people are very timid, can be very timid in these environments. And, and there are a lot, there is some untapped potential for people to buy things if they are, know what to expect going into an interaction. So. Um, that's just another thing to think about. And this here, this is using price, this is the same example from the colors, but this is using price signage to uh, advertise how much stuff costs. But also just one subtle thing here to mention, if you look at the Michigan blueberries, these are $3 for a pint. And these are quarts that are $5 for a quart. Now I am no mathematician, but I think $3 a pint is a higher per unit return than the, the quart prices. The pints here at the lower part, I'm gonna make more money on them, assuming that you know, the container isn't a whole lot more expensive. And where do I put those? Well, I put those right where people can most easily reach them. Just a little strategy. I mean, it's simple, but it's like, Somebody needs to know that they're looking for those quarts. And if later on I sell out of pints, you know what I can do? I can break down those quarts into pints and continue selling those and making a little bit more money. Uh, if I just keep selling people quarts, you know, it just depends on the market. And now there could be some places they want to buy gallons. They aren't interested in many quarts and they want a, a good deal. I mentioned those types of markets earlier. So um, this is another example of different signage giving a very different kind of feel. This is kind of this more French, whatever, um, just to, something to think about. I've already mentioned this a little bit, so I won't go on too long about it, but uh, flyers, brochures, cards, and other promotional items can be good things to have on hand. Not everybody wants them, 
some people really do want them though. Uh, recipes being one of those examples. And so they have the Kentucky Proud recipes that you can get from the extension office, but also sometimes people like to hear what you make with the stuff that you grow. Uh, having your own family recipes can be something that might be, or not even family, but just things that you make. Um, maybe you found them online and you just kind of share them with people. But those kind of take-home items can be helpful, again, to establish a longer-term connection and establish your brand. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, containers and packaging, for me, are part of a take-home item. Uh, again, you can buy the things in bulk, do the stamps, do the stickers, whatever it may be. Um, one thing uh, on the, the uh, containers for, for products, um, ah, no, never mind. I'm going to leave that one, leave that one alone. Um, we do talk a little bit about this. This might be something that your markets might be interested in, people that want to buy things by the pound all the time rather than unitizing them out to quarts and pints or whatever there's positives and negatives to this um it's just something you might want to think think through uh, the biggest positive is the packaging costs are considerably less there are some other downsides um customers are going to pick over stuff or whatever if you let them do it themselves as opposed to kind of grabbing it yourself. So it might be that you want to offer this, but you just grab it and you weigh it out. And, and during COVID times, everything is different right now anyway. A lot of this is more for normal times, but um, just something to think about. Um, this is just a nice, very like clean, modern, you can see, I think this is just outside Chicago, I believe, very like simple, um approach to me they're not getting a lot of use out of their full the full range of their visual display but they you notice they do have these things tipped up to kind of give a little bit better window into what people are looking at um another thing i mentioned the packaging here um this very generic packaging up here this is just people grabbing these out and buying them by the pound these things down here, they, there is a packaging cost associated with this, having a nice little box with a handle. However, you're moving much, like way more peaches at a time because you're not selling them by a pound, you know, one or two at a time. Uh, but on the flip side, you have the cost associated with that. So if I'm going to be selling this and emphasizing how great of a product it is, giving them a tiny billboard to take home, uh, I better be charging a decent premium price uh, for these products and for the agritourism experience. So. One of the things we usually preach, and I, I left it out here because um, of the uncertainty of 2021 still, uh, but just had conversations this week about what, how, how this is gonna go. We do encourage sampling in normal contexts uh, when there's not an unprecedented global pandemic. Um, so the reason we encourage that is just fundamentally because they sell. If you've ever been to Sam's Club, if you've ever been to Costco, and again, during typical times, they offer samples like crazy. And it's not because they really want to share with you the quality of that jalapeno popper. They know if you go, especially around dinner time, and you taste that thing, you are going home with 64 jalapeno poppers in a frozen bag, and they've got you. That's why they do sampling in the first place. And so in the same context, sorry, in the same way in the farmer's market context uh, and, and in the direct marketing context in general, sampling does sell. And I have all these nice data to show you when, uh, when we're conveying that information, but just something to keep in mind and look out for, because there may be some protocols to be able to offer some sampling um, going into this season. So the last one, the last section here, and this one is very short compared to the other two, it's just thinking about moving beyond just accepting only cash. Um, I'm not sure how many of you all already do this. 2020 was a big year for pushing a lot of businesses that previously had not done any online sales or previously had not accepted credit cards or you know debit cards into doing so. And so I just want to give you a little bit of food for thought on this um, and a couple of examples and some reference points. Uh, so I'm going to talk just mostly about credit cards and debit cards. 
uh, I'll briefly mention the EBT and SNAP. I'm not the person to talk to about getting set up for that, but uh, you all may already do that um, anyway. And I'll mention the online store and phone orders just because they're related to credit cards and debit cards. So why would you or why wouldn't you? So in the case of why you would maybe want to think about taking more than just cash, it's going to expand your customer base. Cash carriers, people who carry cash, are in some ways a shrinking number of people. Uh, we are not operating in the same cash economy that we were even 10 years ago, and certainly not 20 years ago. Uh, there is a potential for higher sales volume. In general, we tend to find that people who use a credit card tend to buy more. Now that may not be good if you're the person spending a bunch of money on your credit card, but if you're the person selling it to someone on a credit card, there's a reason, there's a reason why credit card businesses are, are, are in doing just fine for themselves. Another thing it opens is the opportunity to be able to offer gift cards uh, through some of their online and or uh, credit card like uh, sales platforms. So this was really helpful in 2020 for a lot of places because if they weren't able to open for one reason or another, but people wanted to support them or go ahead and, and you know pay up front, or maybe somebody isn't quite ready for a CSA, but they want to be able to support the farmer's market, they were able to offer gift cards. People can buy gift cards and a lot of that processing typically needs to happen on uh, a credit card. As far as not necessarily just accepting credit cards, but maybe even moving to some online or some pre-sales or pre-ordering and pre-paying. It can allow for uh, better planning for market days where you already have a big portion of what you're selling sold prior and you know how much to take. Um, and it also allows people to commit to buying it ahead of time. You know, it, I'm a much bolder purchaser when I'm sitting on my couch than when I'm staring the product right in the face. I get uh, I get nervous in that in the moment. But if I've already pre-purchased it, all I got to do is go pick it up, and the whole thing happens without any money changing hands out in the open. So that might be why you want to take it. People tend to spend more. It might open up pur purchases or a customer base that wasn't previously there. Why wouldn't you want to take it? Well, there is so maybe some potential that with the fees, well, they're going to charge you fees. So there is some portion, if you did the exact number, the exact same amount of sales, and it just switched from cash to credit card, you are going to be making less money than you were before. However, if we take into account the previous slide and say that maybe we're expanding our customer base or people are willing to buy more if I accept credit cards, you have to see if those things come out in the wash. And the, the fees now compared to when I was a kid working retail and cocoon, 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 cocoon Back then it was so expensive. Now it is, it's pretty wild how affordable it can be. So I'm not a rep for anybody. I don't really care. I want you to, you all to succeed and do well. I'm not trying to sell you on, uh, on accepting credit cards. But uh, another question, is it appropriate for your customers? Do you live in a place where everybody just carries cash and wants to pay cash? If they do, then don't worry about it. Don't do it just because somebody, some guy from UK told you you should. Um, but if there are, there, I, I would bet in most places, there are some opportunities to, to make some money with uh, by accepting these things. Internet access is another issue. It does not keep you from being able to take the credit cards. It keeps you from being able to process them instantaneously. Uh, meaning, theoretically, if someone gave you a card that was bad, you are not going to find out until you get connected to the internet and process it later, which is very similar to how it used to be in the old days when you had at the end of the day, you had to type in, I mean, it, it could be that <laughs> you all don't, did never work in a job like that, but at the end of the day, you have to go and enter, you had to go and enter in all the stuff. And if somebody's thing came back wrong, well, you had to have a phone number for them or whatever. So Internet access is, a, is not a barrier to accepting credit cards. It is a barrier to taking them in the exact, mo to, to processing them in that exact moment to guarantee that, uh, that, that the, the purchase goes through. So that's, that could be an issue for some people. Uh, in some cases, people don't have enough product that they're really worried about selling a whole lot more. And that's a realistic thing. And if that's, if that's not for you, no sweat. I'm not trying to push you to do something you don't want to do. Um, as far as on that pre-ordering online store side, we still do have phone, email, texting. Those things still exist. Hey, I'd like to get this. You know, I'd like uh, 10 pounds of tomatoes tomorrow at the market. 
come and pick it up, they pay in cash, boom, done. Um, so again, and I have the internet access thing mentioned twice here because there's also on the online ordering side, do your customers have access to a strong enough internet to wanna be able to buy these things? So uh, to, to use these technologies. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of the why and why not, you may not want to. Uh, the fees though are, in my opinion, relatively affordable. So this is, uh, Square is one of many different uh, technologies that you can use. It is very common. We've had a lot of people who have had very positive results with it. So it's not a recommendation of Square over everything else, but Square has been a positive thing for some people that we've worked with. Um, so their fee, which has lowered since the last time I gave this talk, is 2.6% of a purchase plus 10 cents per transaction, okay? And I'm gonna give you some concrete real world examples on what that looks like here in just a second. There is no, for their normal credit card stuff, there is no monthly fee. If you get a credit card scanner and you sit in your desk drawer and you never use it, you will never pay a fee for it. It is only, you're only paying a fee at the time that the, uh, that the purchases are made and then it's transferred into your bank account and they, they explain everything on their, on their website pretty well. But this is the little white swiper or the you know chip reader or whatever. Um, so if, if you swipe the card, if you use a chip, whatever, and you don't, there's different fees if you type it in versus swiping it because um, they want you to use their reader. Uh, the it's a 2.6 percent plus a 10 cent per transaction fee. So if we take that and actually look at some real numbers, so these are approximate square fees. So don't hold me to this being exactly right. Since there is a per transaction fee, we want to have fewer transactions and have each transaction be a higher dollar amount. So all three of these up here constitute $500 of total sales, the first, the first three items here. In the first scenario, we have 25 transactions that are 20 bucks each. Second scenario, we have 50 and they're 10 bucks each. And in the third, we have 100 and it's $5 each. In all three, we have revenue totaling $500. However, because there are more transactions happening in these lower examples, the fee for the credit card through Square is gonna be slightly higher. However, the overall fee percent here is, is just there so you can see kind of what these numbers already show us, that the more transactions you do and the higher per uh, the, the, sorry, the, the more transaction you do for less money per transaction, the more the, uh, the, the fees are going to ding you. However, um, in all three of these, we have now $484 in our pocket that we would not have had if we hadn't accepted credit cards, assuming that these people want to use credit cards and that we weren't able to access them before. This is just something you have to, to weigh for yourself. Down here at the very, very bottom, I have zero. If you don't accept the credit cards at all, that's zero transactions, which translates into zero fees, which also translates into zero dollars in your pocket total. So that's just, if, if you have people who will accept cash, who will pay cash, great. Don't worry about this. But if you're looking at maybe expanding into some other markets, it's not that crazy. If I told you, that you could access 2,500 more dollars and it was gonna cost you $70 to do it. So you're only gonna take home 2,430. It might be something that you're interested in. So down here is the extreme example. If I have 50 transactions of $50 each, that's 2,500 bucks total. It's overall fee of 2.8%, $70. Okay, these are my figures based on what they tell me the fees are. This is not anything you know official. Whereas one transaction for 2,500 bucks, they're only taking a dime for that one transaction plus the percentage, but it's still only $5 difference here. So, so the, the bottom line for me to take away from this is it's not, I'm not seeing half of this money is going to credit card fees or a, you know, a third is going to credit card fees. You have to assess whether for you, you're going to get more sales out of this than what this, this fee is going to, going to be. But again, you're not going to be charged with Square, at least, this is why I, I know it fairly well. You're not going to be charged the monthly fee for using it. You're mainly going to be uh, charged just for when the actual exchanges happen, when when the the um, purchases happen. So 
back in the day, I've already mentioned multiple times um, my old days in retail. But back in that, back in those days, I think it was like a quarter or fifty cents per transaction or something like that was what the banks were charging. You had to have a phone line and all that stuff, uh, and their specific box that was expensive. And what we had to do is we had to set credit card minimums. You know, we won't take credit cards for less than ten dollars or less than five dollars. In general, I think those days for me, those days would be over uh, if I can get this kind of rate, just because it's not that big of a deal. And if I, they're a returning customer. I'm probably not going to be that hung up on it. I'm also the type of consumer who doesn't like to charge something because I know that they're charging people for the right to do it. But, um, but for me, the credit card minimum would be less of an issue at this point. But um, the bottom line question, are you doing enough more sales with credit cards than you are debit cards than you were before you did debit cards? If you're not doing enough more sales to cover these costs, then it's not worth it for you. That's the bottom line. So uh, the other thing that another thing to think about, I'm not sure the extent to which the groups uh, are able to accept these things, but the uh, electronic benefit transfer card, the EBT card, and SNAP benefits, and WIC and senior vouchers, that's something that we do have the capacity to take that at farmers markets. You can also take it as a direct uh, a direct marketer, like on farm or in the, those contexts as well. The cost associated with that and how to get set up. I know sometimes there's a cost share. Um, but I, Nancy Monroe, the Kentucky Department of Ag, can direct you in the right direction, even if she's not necessarily the exact person to um, to get that set up. So, um, thank you all very much. I'll go ahead and just throw my uh, contact information back up. I know that was a lot, a lot of information, but we wanted to give you some things to think about um, as you go into this marketing season. So, if anybody has questions or or thoughts, um, welcome. You all feel free to unmute yourselves or put questions in the chat box. And um, yeah, Brett, that was awesome. Thank you. I've done a million of these Zoom meetings and they are never, they have still not become not awkward. <laughs> it's just kind of like, oh, I'm just here talking into my computer. Well, I think you did great. And I think there was a, a lot of really good information um, for market vendors. And actually, I'm just gonna go ahead and stop recording. That way, if someone has a question, they might feel a little bit more comfortable asking that.